side and wave to them and tell them welcome to church look to somebody at the other end and tell them welcome to church We appreciate God for the gift of life. Like the choir sang, as we continue to look up to him, he will continually affect our lives and he will continue to breathe his breath of life upon us in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Sovereign Lord, we thank you for this privilege, even of being in your sanctuary and hearing you speak unto us. We ask, Lord, that as these words proceed from these lips of clay, that, Lord, you breathe upon this word and transform it into a message. Cause that every ear and every heart that receives this word, that this word will be a blessing unto them in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh God, that your spirit will take absolute control of this arena right now. I raise a standard against every spirit that is contrary to yours, O oh God, Every part that contends with the superiority of your word in the hearts and in the lives of men, I take authority and charge over right now. I bind them and I command that they be subject to the superiority of your word this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Let every ear be open and every heart circumcised and liberated for the reception of your word. We ask, Eternal Father, that you pass by this house and you drop a blessing even in our bosom this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Eternal Father. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Last Sunday we started a series titled Kitted for Victory. And we looked at the first part. We read from Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 down to 17. And we concentrated on verse 14 and 15. And having looked at that first part of the kit of victory that God has made available for us as Christians, we shall be taking a look at the second part this morning as we look at Ephesians chapter 10 from verse 16 to 17. Ephesians 10, 16 to 17. And it reads, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the framing arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praise the Lord. In the first series, we looked at three parts of the kit. We looked at the belt of truth. We looked at the breastplate of righteousness. And we looked at also the uh, gospel of peace, which we said is like the shoe for the Christian as we continue to run the race and battle the devil. This morning, from the text that we have read, we come to shield number four, uh, kit number four, which is the shield of faith. Now, going back to the passage, Paul used the Roman soldier as his um, apparatus for giving us the analogy. The Roman soldiers carried shields that were covered with heavy animal hide. That is animal skin. And this shield measured approximately two by four feet. That's the measurement. And it was made of wood that was covered with leather. Now in those days, when there was any war, what the opposition did was to dip their arrows in oil. And when they dip these arrows in oil, they will light it before shooting the arrow at the enemy. Now, before any battle came, what the others will do is that they will take this their shield that is made up of wood and hide, that is leather now, and they will dip it in water. When they dip it in water, the skin that is covering the wood will get soaked. And when it gets soaked, whenever the arrow of the 
enemy from the other side comes, all they just need to do is to use the shield to block themselves. And as the arrow pierces that leather, because the leather is soaked in water, the fire that the enemy puts at the tip of the arrow that was dipped in oil will naturally just burn off. Praise the Lord. And that will keep the soldier safe, both from the arrow and from the fire that came from the arrows also. So the shield were very vital to the protecting of the soldier from getting born. Now, whether we like it or not, the moment you declare yourself a child of God, even if you are not seriously born again, but you are in church, the devil knows that as you constantly hear the word of God, one day you will open up your heart unto God. So what it does is that the moment you make that declaration, or you come before God, the devil will constantly continue to fire arrows at you. And these arrows are directed at your heart. Now, the purpose of these arrows, like those fiery arrows of the army, is to make sure that there are subtle doubts in your heart about God. There are subtle doubts in your mind about God and the truth of God's word. And the truth is that the moment the devil is able to establish doubt in your heart, your faith diminishes. So he fires these arrows and he allows them to continually come. And this is because the devil understands the flame and fire principle. And what is that? And that is the fact that a spark can ignite a very big fire. James described it. In his epistle, he said that the tongue is like a matchstick. Just a little strike and you add it somewhere. With that little spark, it can lead to a very big conflagration that is going to consume so many things that are far, far bigger than the matchstick. So the devil understands this. So what he does is that he constantly fires these arrows of doubt. These arrows of you not relying completely on God's word, of not trusting God's word. He fires them into your heart and into your mind. And when he does this, they begin to fester and they begin to grow. And those doubts can become very big later. Charles Spurgeon said, doubt discovers difficulties which it never solves. Doubt discover difficulties that that doubt will never solve. He said it creates hesitancy, despondency, despair. Its progress is the decay of comfort, the death of peace. So when you allow doubts that the enemy fires at you, when you allow them to continue in your heart and you continue to uh, ruminate over them, Transposition says that as it progresses, it will lead to the decay of your comfort. You will no longer be comfortable in God's house. You will no longer be comfortable with God. You will no longer be comfortable with the relationship you have with God. You will no longer be comfortable with the word of God. And it says, as that happens, it will lead to the death of peace. Remember, we said that the gospel, which was the third thing that we looked at last week, we said it is the gospel of peace. And that should be the readiness that carries your leg, that gives you a firm footing. So once doubt is shot into your heart, that peace that you naturally have with your relationship with God, that peace begins to vanish. And once that happens, Charles Spurgeon says, a said belief comes in that speaks life into a man, that doubt is what nails down the coffin of a man. In other words, when the devil shoots those arrows onto you as a Christian, his ultimate aim is to make sure that you end up in the coffin. And doubt is what will put the final nail into that coffin. And you and I know that once a coffin is nailed, where is it headed to? The graveyard. So when the devil fires darts of doubt to your heart, you will need so from the feed that you have fed your heart, your faith from God's word, the shield that comes from the faith that develops from the word of God, you need it to starve your doubts. 
as your faith increases, you starve your doubt. But as your doubt increases, you starve your faith. So if you must not do that, you must make sure that you constantly shield your heart from these arrows by the faith that you get from the word of God. If there are any doubts or seeds of doubt in your mind today, then you cannot win the battle and you cannot be a victor. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Your faith is your shield for victory. So if your faith feels less confident than you wish it did, ask the Lord to increase your faith. Praise the Lord. In Mark chapter 9 verse 24, there was a request from Jesus. Say, I have faith, but oh God, please increase my faith. It is also very necessary for us to constantly ask the Lord to also help us to increase our faith as we continually face the arrows of the enemy. And how do you do that? You need to find verses that feed your faith and fill your world with them and also your faith on God's character and not on the circumstance. You must learn to fix your faith on God's character and not the circumstances that face you. Praise the Lord. If you put your eyes on the circumstance, you'll be like Peter. Who after saying to Jesus, if you are the one, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come. And he came and started walking on water. But the Bible says at a particular point, he left his focus on Jesus and focused on the storm that was around. And when he did that, what happened? He began to sink. And he had to shout that, Master, help me. And the Bible says, Jesus stretched forth his hand and held him and stopped him from sinking. So focus your attention on the character of God. Learn that God is trustworthy. Learn that God is faithful. He will never fail. If he has not done it in the situations of others, he won't start at your time. So trust his character and always rely on him. When you do that, it will help your faith to remain stable. We have also said you must find verses from the scripture that will feed your faith. Because faith is like a seed, it grows. And when we are talking about faith here, we are not just talking about the saving faith alone. No. We are talking about the faith that trusts God even after salvation. So that faith needs to be nurtured. It needs to grow. And the only way it can grow is that you need to constantly feed it with the word of God. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by what? Hearing by the word of God. The things you hear matter a lot on the outcome of your heart. Remember, we said some other time that what you feed to your heart is what comes out because garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed fear to your heart, your life will be characterized by fear. But if you feed your faith by the word of God, when the devil fires those arrows of doubt, when he's telling you you are not able to, when he's telling you that you are not the type that should be qualified for this, when he's telling you that your ability is not enough, when he tells you that you are a failure, you will be able to look at him in the face and tell him, no, these things that you are firing at my heart, by the word of God, I reject those arrows and I put them out. And then you are able to say, I am what God says I am. So the shield keeps us from the fiery darts of the enemy. And whether you like it or not, every day the devil is firing. Praise the Lord. By the things we hear from the media, he's firing. By the things people come around to tell us, he's firing. By the subtle suggestions that he makes into our hearts, he's firing. So you must make sure that you put out those fires by your faith. Praise the Lord. You and I know that doubts will naturally creep in into our hearts. Hello? None of us can claim not to have doubts at one point or the other. That's what makes us human. But when we leave those doubts and now focus on the word of God, we become supernatural humans, which is what God wants us to be. So, the shield of faith is what is given to us to help us put out those fiery darts. And that brings us to number five. The Bible says, not just the shield of faith, as you take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Verse 17 says, take up the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. Now, back to the Roman soldier. The Roman soldier used the helmet 
to protect his head. And the simple reason was because if his head is wounded from a blow, from a sword, or from an arrow, he wouldn't be able to think properly. Praise the Lord. And any man who is not thinking properly, what happens to him? You make mistakes. You make wrong judgments. So the ailment guaranteed sanity for the head of the soldier. It guarantees sanity. Now every believer needs to have the mind of Christ under the control of the Almighty God. Because when a person is saved for the first time, that person has the right mind and becomes sane. It's at salvation that our minds become sane. We become correct-headed. Now a person without the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ has a form of insanity. That is why he can do anything without thinking about the repercussions. Praise the Lord. So, for such a person who does not have the mind of Christ, such a person does not operate with the mind that God made for them to have. So, you must understand that the most important thing at all times is your assurance of salvation. Remember when we took the first kit, we said it was not a mistake that Paul started first and foremost with what? The belt of truth. And we said every other thing you do, if it's not founded on the truth that Jesus is Lord and Savior, then you'll be defeated by the enemy. And so he comes here again, he talks about the element of salvation. If your head must be protected, if you must think rightly, if you must take right decisions, then you must not lose the consciousness you must not lose the assurance of salvation because at any point you do every other thing you do is done on doubt and the bible says anything that is done outside of faith and done in doubt what will god do will he honor it or not he won't praise the lord so it is therefore no surprise that one of the areas that the devil uses to constantly attack Christians is to first of all make them doubt their sonship or their daughtership of the kingdom of God. Are you sure you are born again? If you are saved, why will this not happen to you? Or why is this one happening to you? No, your salvation is questionable. Ask yourself where. You are not saved. And that's one of the reasons why every time a message is preached and the invitation for coming to give your life to Christ is made, some people will do it in the morning. Another message is preached in the afternoon and the invitation is made. What will they do? They will still come out. In the evening, come and preach another message and still ask them to come. They will still come. Because they are not sure. The question is, if you are not sure of the son or daughter of whom you are, how do you answer presence and when the roll call is being made? Hello? Assuming you are a student in school or you are a worker and they said they are going for biometrics, come and clarify whether you are still alive or you are a ghost worker. And then you are there and they are calling Henry Matthew. Henry Matthew. Henry Matthew. And I'm looking. And people are saying, it is you they are calling. Uh, me, it can't be me now. Uh, am I Henry Matthew? But that's what some of us do. And when that happens, God looks at us and he begins to ask questions. What is wrong with you, my son, my daughter? So you need to be very sure of the fact that you are born again. And the only person that can give you that assurance is yourself and the spirit of God. Not any other person. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So the question this morning is, do you know that you are saved? 
If yes, thank God for you. But if you are not sure, you better get that settled now. Because if you are not sure, then you cannot win the battle or ever be victorious. Now to have the helmet in place, you must surrender your thoughts and, don't, and then line them up with scriptures. You must do what? You must let your thoughts align with scriptures. The Bible says, if the Son of Man sets you free, you are free indeed. If you don't accept that you are free indeed, then the devil will begin to give you 1,001 reasons why you should remain tight. And the Bible says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Therefore, let not yourself be entangled anymore with any yoke of slavery. At one time, you were tied like the proverbial hen. Okay? Know that when you tie a fowl for some time, the fowl is restricted to that environment. And the day you lose it, the fowl will still be thinking, I am tied. I will still remain in that place. Until when he begins to experiment and discover that ah, I can move. And then he takes a step. And then he goes a little. He goes a little. And then it suddenly dawns on it that it has been set free. So the Bible says it is that kind of freedom, that loosening that Christ has loosened us. Therefore, let not your thoughts tie you down. Let not the devil suggest to you that you are tied. And even if there are ropes or chains that are tying you, the same power of Christ, the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the grave is available to cut those chains loose. Therefore, align your thoughts with the scriptures. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, that you should set your minds on things that are above, not on earthly things. So allow the things that always play in your heart the things that are glorifying to God. Things that are beneficial to your life. Not negative. The problem with a lot of us is that as we come before God, we concentrate more on the things that God has not done yet than the ones that he has done. Oh, I'm looking for a job. I've not gotten a job. I'm looking for a husband. Husband has not come. I'm looking for a child. Child has not come. But do you know that if the breath of life is taken away from you, jobs and husbands and wives and children become useless. Huh? There's a saying from my angle of the state, or the Nisigogo or the, huh? the one who has gone the other way does not listen to the cry of his child anymore. So no matter a mother lost her child, the moment she dies, the child can cry from now till next year. She doesn't hear. So instead of concentrating more on the things, on the job that I have not gotten, on the healing that I have not gotten, I should first and foremost thank God that I'm alive at all. Because it is the one who is alive that healing is necessary for. As I thank God for being alive, then because I enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving in my heart, what will he do? Then he will give me the healing I'm seeking for. So, let your heart be filled with things that are from above and not things that are on earth. Remember the Lord's character and faithfulness in scripture as well as in your life experience. Always take a look back at where you are coming from and where you are now. You may not be where you want to be, but I'm sure you are not where you used to be. Praise the Lord. If we always reflect on that, it will give us a heart of gratitude. Praise the Lord. Sometimes, when I sit down and I look at my life and I think of where I was coming from, where God took me from and where I am today. I don't have any cause regretting that I follow the path of God. I don't. 
Does that mean there are no desires that have not been fulfilled? Of course there are. Does that mean I don't desire a better life? Of course I do. But first, I need to first and foremost be able to thank God for where I find myself now. Why hoping for a better life tomorrow? Praise the Lord. Alright. So, you must understand that you need to wash your mind with the renewing of God's word. As Romans 12, 2 says, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You must constantly allow your mind to be renewed. Don't concentrate on the negatives, but let the positives always renew your mind. And the Bible says, then you'll be able to test, not just to test, but you'll also be able to approve that which is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Praise the Lord. There's a good will of God. There's a pleasing will of God. There's a perfect will of God. It is only when you constantly renew your mind by the word of God that you are able to understand what is the good, what is the pleasing, and what is the perfect will of God. And of course, for God, he always wants the perfect will for you and I. So we need to constantly renew our mind. If we must get there. Whatever has been attacking your insanity today, by the power that is upon this altar, it is set on fire in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare you sane in your head and in your mind in the name of Jesus. So everything that has been playing with your head, that has been making your thoughts not to align with God's word, today we set it on fire in the name of Jesus Christ. Kit number six, which is number three for today, is the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. And the Bible says that this sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now this is the only weapon that stands alone in the kit of victory. And that's in the sense that while all others are defensive, the sword of the spirit, which Paul says is the word of God, is the only dual purpose kit. At it, it is both defensive and offensive. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All that we have been talking about since, we have been saying, when the devil attacks you, when he sends the arrows, you do use this one to defend yourself. Use this one to, to hold yourself. Use this one to give yourself a grip. But the sword of the spirit, which Paul says is the word of God, is both for defense and then also for attack. If you have watched Roman films, you will know that when the enemy is coming, he comes also with a sword and a shield also. All right. Now, when there is now close contact in battle, as the enemy raises his sword to hit the soldier, he either uses his shield or his sword to block it. And when he does that, as he blocks it, he waves it off. And what does he do? He uses the same sword to attack the enemy back. So the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is the only weapon that God has given unto us that is both for the offensive and defensive. Now, when the enemy fires his arrows at you, you use the word of God to defend yourself. Praise the Lord. So when he says, this sickness you are having is going to kill you, you say, no. The scripture says, I shall not die but live to declare the glory of God. That is defensive. Praise the Lord. All right. But it becomes offensive when you are engaged in spiritual warfare. Thus says the Lord, I shall trample upon scorpion and snakes, and they shall not hurt me. Therefore, I trample you on that feet. You are now using it as an offensive. Praise the Lord. All right. So, Jesus, during his temptation by the devil, after his 40 day fast, made a very good use of this weapon against the devil when he repeatedly said it is written thereby quoting the word of god which is the sword of the spirit now when we are tempted the most effective weapon that god has given to us as believers is the sword of the spirit which is the word of god praise the lord that is our most effective weapon and that is why paul said that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. 
But the word of God is very powerful. And when we use it, it can bring effect to us. So if you must be victorious, be a man or woman of the word. Because with the word, you can parry the arrow of the enemy or the devil and you can also cut the devil down to size. The devil fears a Christian who knows God's word and uses it. Did you hear that? The devil fears any Christian who knows God's word and uses it rightly. It is one thing for you to know. Hello? It is one thing for you to know. But it's another thing for you to use it rightly. Remember that when Jesus was tempted, when he started quoting the scriptures, what did the devil do? Huh? He also went scriptural. He also started quoting scripture. Jump! For the scripture says, he shall give his angels charge over you. He quoted the scriptures, but that was not the right use of scripture. So, the devil is afraid of the one who knows the scripture and knows how to use it rightly. For some of us, the scriptures we know are used to defend us in evil. So years back, I had a friend whom we got wind of that impregnated a, a lady and then went and committed an abortion. So when the news came, we went to him, my friend, and some other pastor friends, we went to him and said, ah, what happened? It was enough that you even committed fornication in the first place. But why go for an abortion? You know what he told us? He said, is the anointing not still flowing? The Bible says the righteous man shall fall seven times and seven times he shall rise again. Did he quote scriptures? Yes. But was that what the scripture was saying? No. Some of us like quoting scriptures to defend ourselves in evil. And so we use religiosity to perpetuate evil and then paint a wrong picture to outsiders of what Christianity is. And that is why it's very difficult today to go and preach to anybody and get the person to listen. Because a lot of us are living in falsehood. We quote the scriptures, but our lifestyle does not tally with what we quote at all. There's one that is very popular. Even though it's not directly a quotation of the scripture, there's love in sharing. Huh? When do we quote that one? When you are holding and I want to collect, I can easily use that one to say, ah, remember there's love in sharing so that I can get from you. But when I'm the one that is holding it, will I quote there's love in sharing and share with you? No. Okay, there's peace in having your own. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't use scriptures to defend yourself in evil. That's not the purpose of the scriptures. Because if you do that, then the devil will know that you are baseless. And like the seven sons of Sceva, he will ask you the question, this scripture you are quoting, on what basis are you quoting it? Because as God knows those who are his, the devil also knows those who are his own, but are pretending to be God's own. He knows them. That is why we always go to God and say, God, remember this one, this one that is asking now, this one that is asking, is not your own. No. Don't, 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 don't do it too. It's not your own. It's not your own. Praise the Lord. So the sword of the Spirit is very, very important for us. If you must be victorious, you must live a victorious life. Learn to be a student of the Bible. Learn scriptures. Learn to meditate on scriptures. Because God told Joshua, he says, on this you meditate day and night. In season and out of season. Not when it is convenient for you. But learn to meditate on scriptures. Because there are going to be times when the chiefs will be down. It is the scriptures you know that will bail you out. So you must learn the scriptures by heart. We are one 
generation that has so much of the scripture available to us and we are the generation that knows it the less. Praise the Lord. We must go back to the word of God because that is our most potent weapon when temptation comes. It doesn't matter what comes your way. Whether it is physical or spiritual, the scriptures will always have an answer. But like my lecturer in school, we always say that the Holy Spirit is not a fuller of ignorance. Huh? Reverend Dr. Oluwai Binomo, who taught me preaching, will always say that. That the Holy Spirit is not a fuller of ignorance. Yes, the Holy Spirit will act. But you also need to do your personal study. Because at the end of the day, it is what you have studied into your heart that the Holy Spirit will bring out for you on the day of need. I always explain it this way. What happens is that there are some things that we have at home. You just buy them and you don't make use of them immediately. Maybe you were just going on the road and you just suddenly saw this thing. Oh, let me just buy it since I have some money. And then you buy it and go and keep it at home. You go out another day, you buy and go and keep it at home. And then one day something happens. And you need something to solve what has happened. And then you suddenly remember, oh, I bought so so and so thing. Maybe it's a screwdriver or a plier. I need something to screw this. And then you just suddenly remember, okay, I bought one screwdriver two months ago. Where is it? And then you go into your store and begin to search for it. That's what happens. When you learn scriptures, they are dumped in your heart. It may not be useful today. It may not be useful tomorrow. But any day that there is a crisis, what the Holy Spirit does is that it comes into the store of your heart and ransacks your heart. And in seconds, he's able to pick out the one he knows is the right word to solve that situation. And then he pushes it to your heart and you're able to recite it. But if you don't stop, the Holy Spirit is not a fuller of ignorance. Eh? He won't bring what is not there. That is the reason why we need to constantly meditate on the word of God. Why do you do your daily devotions and there is a scripture that is given to you to read and there is an interpretation so that you meditate on it and it becomes part of your life. Why do you attend Sunday school on Sunday? That is the reason. Why do we come for Bible study? That is the reason. Why do we preach in church? So that the word of God will be in your heart. Because the word is what will get us to be victorious when we are faced with the challenges of life. So if you must be a strong Christian, if you must be victorious and live in victory, then be a person, a man or a woman of the word of God. Because the word will feed your faith. And then your faith becomes a shield unto you. Praise the Lord. Okay? And then the word will also become your offense and defensive weapon against the enemy. Shall we bow our heads as we pray together? Has the Lord spoken to you this morning? Are you kitted in this kit? How first and foremost is your sanity? Are you sure that you are a child of God? Do you have that assurance inside your heart that you are really a child of God? That's what defends your head. And you and I know that you can lose every other part of your heart, of your body, and probably survive. But if you lose your head, you are gone forever. So how firm is your assurance of salvation? That is the beginning point. Am I sure I am safe? Ask yourself that question this morning. And if the answer your heart is giving you is a yes, 
good. But if it's a no, you can invite Jesus into your heart this morning. It will cost you nothing. It's just for you to bow down your head right where you are and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I confess that I'm a sinner. Cleanse me today by your blood and accept me as your son or your daughter, whichever is applicable to you. And ask him to take away your name from the book of death unto the book of life. And that is all that there is to it. Make that confession genuinely from your heart and you are born again. How strong is your feet? That is your shield. Who told us that the shield of the Roman soldier is dipped in water, and that water represents the word of God. It is when your faith is soaked in the water of God, in the word of God, that it is able to stand and put out the fiery arrows of the enemy. This morning, I want you to talk to God, even as you say, Oh Lord of heaven. Repeat after me, say, O oh Lord of heaven. In any way, my faith has become unproductive. Let there be a restoration now in the name of Jesus Christ. Can you pray that prayer and say, Lord, in any way my faith has become unproductive. It is no longer strong enough to put out the doubt of the enemy. It is no longer enough to put out the fiery arrows of the enemy. I have allowed doubt to eat into my heart. I am no longer at peace. I am no longer comfortable with God. I am beginning to think of alternatives of what to do and what not to do because I have allowed my faith not to be productive. Say, Lord, today, let there be a restoration. Let there be a restoration. Let there be a restoration. Lord, rekindle my faith in you once again. Let my faith be strong so that my doubts will become starved. Ask that your trust in God will remain resolute. It will remain resolute. Nothing will shake it. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Say, my father, my father, every arrow of doubt fired by the enemy against my life and destiny, I put you out today in the name of Jesus. Every arrow of doubt fired by the enemy against my life and destiny, I quench you. I put you out today in the name of Jesus Christ. Make that prayer quickly. Make that prayer. Every fire, every arrow of doubt that is causing your heart not to be stable, that is causing your salvation not to be stable, that is causing the word of God not to be effective in your heart, that is causing your belt of truth not to be stable, today decree and declare that that arrow, that arrow be extinguished, be put out in the name of Jesus. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. For some of us, as we sit down and we begin to reflect over the issues and the circumstances of life, around us, certain thoughts begin to come in into our hearts. You begin to think distorted thoughts and sometimes they even play out in our dream world. And before you know what is happening, the devil begins to suggest to you that that is what is about to happen. And these thoughts continue to play and play and if you are not careful, they begin to manifest. This morning we are going to pray. As you lift up your right hand and say in the name of Jesus, any attack of the devil on my sanity to make my thinking void and distorted, I cancel you today in the name of Jesus. Say, any attack of the enemy on my thought life, on my sanity to make me to begin to think things that are contrary, 
things that are not in line with the word of God, things that are not in line with the purpose and plan of God in my life. Say, today I destroy you, I destroy you, I destroy you. Thoughts that are telling you that you cannot make it anymore. Thoughts that are telling you that you are a failure. Thoughts that are telling you that you are not beautiful enough. Thoughts that are telling you that you are not qualified. Thoughts that are telling you that it is not your type that God will answer. Begin to reflect, begin to reject them now. And begin to decree and declare that they are cancelled in the name of Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody has even physically told you that it is not your type. Somebody has threatened you physically that you cannot. It is not going to be possible. And because of that, you have started thinking, yes, that this thing that this person has said is actually happening in my life. Today, begin to reject those thoughts. Begin to reject those thoughts. Because that's not God's thoughts concerning you. That's not God's plan concerning you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Say, my father, my father, today I rekindle the sharpness of God's word in my life and my situations. By the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, I rebuke every strange word or thought that says I am not what God says I am. Can you make that a prayer? Every thought or every word that says I am not what God says I am. I rebuke you today. I cast you out into the bottomless feet. I cast you out of my heart. Cast you out of my life. Cast you out of my destiny. Cast you out of my thoughts. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Say, O oh Lord, I stand upon the assurance of my salvation and pronounce my mind, my soul, and my heart healed and sound in the name of Jesus. Can you make that a prayer? Can you make that a prayer? Stand it upon the assurance of salvation that we have in Jesus. We pronounce our minds, we pronounce our hearts, we pronounce our souls. Sound and healed. Sound and healed from every thought, every doubt, every attack, every fairy arrows. We pronounce our minds sound and healed this morning. Healed from every negative thought. Healed from every negative influence. Healed from every negative pattern. We renew our mind today. We renew our mind today. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. In the mighty name of Jesus, lift up your right hand and declare with me. I declare that I am a winner and that I am victorious in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, let your amen sound like thunder. Thank you, Father. Because your word is forever settled in heaven. And nothing can take away an altar of your word. Your word declares us winners. Your word declares us victorious. Today we take up the kit of victory. We take up, Lord God in heaven, the truth that comes from knowing you as our belt. We take, oh Lord God in heaven, the shield of faith. We take up, oh God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation that gives us sanity. We take, O oh Lord God in heaven, even the shoes that are fitted on our legs from the gospel. And we take up your word this morning. Your word that says that we are winners and not losers. We take them up this morning and we decree and declare that from the crown of our head down to the sole of our feet, we'll be shielded and we'll remain victorious even in this kit that you have made available for us in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray eternal God that in any way any one of us is going through one situation or circumstance or the other that seems to project or seems to suggest that these kids have been discarded that these kids have been destroyed i pray today by the grace and the mercy of god that your kids be restored in the name of jesus christ 
and that that situation will give way to the superior power of God in the name of Jesus. I declare you free in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit. And the church of God shout aloud, Amen. God bless you.